Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and leading figures from the world of football talk about the first match they ever attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm delighted to say that today's guest is Jim White. Jim is a journalist, author and broadcaster who was one of the founding members of The Independent back in 1986. Also worked for The Guardian before joining The Telegraph, where he is still working. He regularly appears on BBC Radio, most noticeably as a contestant on Five Lives Fighting Talk. Hi, Jim. It's great to have you on the podcast and can't wait to hear about your first match, which I think may surprise a few people. So <laughs> if you could give us give us the build up to that match and what your expectations were and where you ended up, that would be a great place to start. So I was brought up in uh, South Manchester, uh, Altrincham, which when I meet fellow Mancunians, they always say, oh, right, so you're posh then. Um, it's the it's the swanky bit of uh, of Manchester. And um, I was football mad. I used to play it all the time. And in the playground, uh, I, listen, I don't want to give away too much about how old I am, but we're talking, I was in the primary school playground uh, when Man United had won the... Uh, European Cup and City won the league title and we used to div divide up between United and City fans uh, and so on and I, and I you know uh, obviously I, I found United more glamorous I was mad on George Best etc uh, so uh, you know I was I was already uh, a died in the wall uh, United fan but and this is the important caveat my dad had no idea about football. He was completely clueless. Uh, he loved his rugby and he loved uh, cricket, but football was an area he didn't know anything about. Um, and he felt he ought to take me to a game because he saw uh, his love, love football and he was a really great, kind bloke. And he thought, right, I better take my lad to a game. That's what fathers and sons do. Let's have a look then. Oh, I know. Altrincham, they've got a football club. They've got a team. We'll go to Alty. So we went down Moss Lane and we watched um, in uh, January, uh, sorry, it, it was in 1968, January 1968. So I'd have been, uh, I don't want to give too much about my age, I'd have been nine. And uh, we saw Altrincham against Barrow in the second round of the FA Cup. So at that stage, Altrincham were a non-league side and they have, always been a non-league side, which we'll move on to. But um, Barrow were actually in the third division then. So this was, you know, a potential FA Cup giant killing. Uh, it is it is quite a long time ago, that that game. But you, you told me before we did this podcast that you actually have some fairly clear memories, which I'm really impressed by and looking forward to hearing about a few details about the game. Yeah, well... Barrow were uh, actually Barrow were in the third division, as you say. They had yeah. two seasons in the third division, which is the highest they've ever been uh, in the football league. Although they're in the playoff zone of League Two at the moment, so they might get back there. Uh, the yes. third division in those days was the third tier, League One, as we call it now, and um, so they could get back there. They could be matching it. Um, so, so they were really big, and and Alty had just come out of the Cheshire uh, County League and were founder members of the Northern Premier League. So they were pretty small time, but and this is the really important thing about Alty, they'd just been taken over by two entrepreneurs who ran a television rental. Um, firm uh, that was all over South Manchester, started in Altrincham, but it was all over South Manchester. And and your many, many younger listeners, Richard, will, will be starting at that point to think, what on earth was a television rental firm? <laughs> well, yeah. you used to rent your telly. That was it. You didn't buy a telly. You rented it. And um, these two guys uh, were called White and Swales, Noel White and Peter Swales. And and they had a they had a a, a, a TV rental shop on the high street in Altrincham, which is where we got our telly from. And White and Swales took over Altrincham and obviously they had ambitions uh, that went well beyond it. 
Noel White went on to be chairman at Liverpool or on the board at Liverpool. And Peter Swales, notoriously uh, the man with the worst comb over in football, uh, <laughs> went on to be um, chairman of Manchester City. Uh, for quite a long time, he- eventually hated by the fans. Uh, I always assumed he was a, you know, he he was a red. He he went there to do him down, but he did a good job. To be fair to him, uh, went down yeah. to do sit, went to City to do him down. So these two guys were very very ambitious, and they would just taken over Alty, and they put money into it. And uh, one of the things they did was they bought a striker uh, in. Uh, and and they were clearly paying him a lot of money. And he was called Jackie Swindells. What a magnificent name. My dad found Jackie Swindells the funniest name. Imagine, my dad used to say, uh, my, my dad was Irish, my, my dad used to say, uh, uh, but he, he, he's, he's, he's called Swindles. What's all this Swindells? <laughs> you know, his name is a Swindler. He's a Swindler. Um, right. But, you know, Remarkably, in the Cheshire League, Jackie Swindles scored 82 goals in one season. Move over Dixie Dean. That yeah, is yeah. remarkable. He played 229 times for Alt. He scored 195 times. I mean, you know, quite an extraordinary uh, goal poacher. And so, uh, you know, Alt were Jackie Swindles. Uh, 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 and and you know they had a manager called Freddie Pye, who was a really sharp um, uh, operator as well. And and I used to it was kind of uh, it was almost an entree into journalism as well. I used to get the Ultium Guardian. Well, my dad got the Ultium Guardian on a on a, a, a Thursday or whatever, and I would pour over the back page what Freddie Pye was up to, who he was going to buy, what Jackie Swindells was doing. You know, I loved the the newspaper contact with with uh, with the club. So Jackie Swindells was was uh, uh, my absolute hero. But I have to say, in uh, in the playground, uh, people were more interested in these no hopers like Francis Lee, Mike Summerby, uh, George Best, <laughs> Bobby Charlton, yeah. who were. By the way, Richard, playing seven miles down the road, but my dad took me to watch Jackie Swindells. Yeah, so great to have your first hero, Jackie Swindells. Um, was there a part of you, as you will see, quite a keen Man United fan in the, already, that disappointed you that your dad decided, although Old Trafford was only just down the road, <laughs> to take you to Moss Lane instead. Was there some element of resentment or you just thought, fair play, this is where no, we're going? I, I was so keen to go to a football match. I suspect I'd probably been badgering him for a long time. Take me to a game, take me to a game. He had no idea about whatever and took me to Alty. Uh, no, I was I was really pleased to go. I, I was just excited to be there. Let's be honest, Moss Lane wasn't Old Trafford. It, it wasn't even Main Road. Um, you know, it was, it was pretty small. Uh, there was one main stand, which I think they've still got actually, which White and Swales built uh, there. I think they've still got that stand. Um, I mean, they've done a, 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 an awful lot of work latterly there. Um, but um, we we didn't go in the main stand. We stood uh, on, on one side about the halfway line. Uh, and, and I just, I don't know why, I just have in my mind this memory of two Barrow fans. Uh, so there was um, a, a terrace along one side with a roof over it, a little stand, but it was it was basically about three steps of terrace. And I remember seeing these two Barrow fans in that terrace, and we we stood there, and I just stared at them because they had huge rosettes. Do you remember those rosettes? Oh, that, yeah. that was what you that's what you wore to cup games uh, in in the in the sixties. Giant rosettes with a silver foil. FA Cup in the middle, giant blue and white rosettes for yeah. uh, um, Barrow, and I, you know I was so jealous of their of their giant rosettes. These two Barrow fans, and uh, you know I, I just stared at them for you know quite a long time. Probably made them feel a bit uneasy, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was this little twerp looking at this. So, <laughs> um, 
Rosettes, I, I, I absolutely do remember. I'm of a similar age to you, and I, I clearly remember that. I also remember rattles. Did, did, did rattles. you take a rattle to a game? Absolutely. Absolutely. Two things that accompanied me to that ulti game. One was, uh, now in these days, of course, outside the ground, I'd have been able to buy a half and a half Barrow and Ulti scarf. Uh, but yes. back then, if you wanted to display your colours, you needed your granny to knit you a scarf. And my granny had knitted me a scarf for Christmas, wow. red and white, uh, Man United, but it's the same colours for Ulti. They're playing red and white stripes and black shorts, so it was fine. Uh, red and white scarf. And uh, uh, and uh, my granny had also bought me a rattle, so I had both. Oh, a wow. knitted scarf and a rattle. Doesn't get better than that, does it, really? Um, have you still kept the scarf? Is it is it in your loft? No, no, I think it got a bit. I'll I tell you, I'll I, I tell you what. You, you might might want to go on and talk about my Man United thing. But when I was a teenager, what we had were these kind of silk-like nylon scarves. They were the hip yes. hip thing to have. You wore them round your wrist, uh, yeah, yeah. and 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 that was, you know, I didn't want to be seen dead in my granny's knitted scarf when I was going to Old Trafford, obviously. No, of course. I remember those silk scarves because they used to get really dirty very quickly. And, yes. Because you know, they went around your wrist and you, wherever you went, it was there. And you got home, it looked like it had been, you know, chucked down a coal mine because it was yes. a disgraceful. You know, and you go back and your mother looks and you go, do I have to clean this again? Why, why are you bothering with that? Um, and, you know, the knitted scarf, I'm sure, had a little bit more, it was a bit more robust. And it, how how fortunate that you had red and white and black, basically, as your two colours for... Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. United. Um, exactly. So I had a quick look at uh, Altering and Barrow. I must admit, there isn't a huge amount of information out there. Maybe I'm not looking in the right place. But I do know that um, a chap called Bert Lister scored the goal for Altrincham. Uh, I don't know if you remember him to see. I mean, obviously, Jackie Swindells was your main hero. No. Do you remember Bert Lister? I'm afraid not. Bert Lister, his name is not is not engraved in my mind. I, I, I can't remember the goals. I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, I, I mean, the, the, the memories I have are, are weird, you know, of, of that occasion. It's interesting, isn't it? So I was nine. It's interesting, isn't it, what? sears itself on the memory i can remember the pitch i can remember the players i can remember those rosettes i can remember where we stood but i have no memory of and i know barrow won two one uh and they went on to the third round and they lost to leicester in the third round they got a third round home tie against leicester and wouldn't that have been great if Alter had got that um but no uh the the, the barrow um barrow went out in the next round they won two one. I think I can't even remember whether Ulti, you know, it was one all or anything. I don't know. I, I literally have no memory of it. And uh, you know, in these days of sort of ubiquity of um, of, of footage and everyone, even non league clubs are on I follow and so on. You, you'd be able to find footage of a game. You know, look at Maidstone United. Okay, My, Maidstone United had this great cup run uh, through uh, th- this season. Uh, got to the fifth round. They started in the first preliminary round, right? You could get footage of the first preliminary round now. You could go back and have a look at Maidstone doing that in the first preliminary round. Whereas, you know, Ulti, this was quite a big game for Ulti. Second round of the cup against the proper league club. Nothing. There is nothing out there at all. It is, yeah. In a way, is it a shame or is it quite good? Because, you know, we don't need everything documented and recorded. So in a way, it's a nice, hazy memory. And and you're, like many of the people who come on this podcast, you don't remember the goals specifically. It's the extraneous stuff that's important. It's the rosette. It's the two Barrow fans having... You know, there's eyes seared into them. Were there, were there any other Barrow fans? I mean, I don't know how many attended the, the game. Yes. The, the away the, following was pretty good. 
Yes, there was a, a group of them. I remember we walked back home afterwards and we saw them going back to their cars, you know, in, in triumph. I, I have that memory. I, I can't remember. Uh, when I got a bit older and used to go and watch Alti, Alti became this phenomenal FA Cup. Uh, non-league side, the, you know, this yeah. I- I- remarkable record they've got in the FA Cup. It hadn't started at that point, you know, th- no. this was to come. This was a, uh, uh, you know, mid-1970s, late-1970s phenomenon for them. Um, I think they got to the FA Cup third round four seasons in succession as a non-league club between 79 and 82. That, you know, sh- showed what they were uh, and in those days uh, you know I used to go to those games and we'd stand me and the lads used to stand on on. there was a bank at one end we used to stand there and the opposition fans were at the other end I can't even remember whether that uh, um, you know divide between home and away was in place for the Barrow game I don't remember where the Barrow but they were clearly mixing because you know the, the, those two uh Barrow fans with the rosettes were standing with us for the game. Yeah, so actually you're right. When I was doing my research into Altrincham, uh, they did indeed reach the third round four seasons in a row. And no other team, even in the third or fourth divisions, had done that over that period. And I think they're the only club, to non-league club, to do it. So feather in the cap or in the rosette or wherever you want to put it. Um, and I just wanted to go back to Bert Lister actually very quickly because he did score the goal for Altrincham and he didn't really move, in his career, he didn't really move beyond Greater Manchester. So he was at Man City, then he went to Oldham where I found out in a 11 nil victory over Southport in 1962, he scored six right-footed Whoa. goals. Six right-footed goals which apparently is a league record. I don't know. I haven't found anyone else who scored more than six right-footed goals in one game. Uh, and then he went to Rochdale, Stockport, and finally Altrim. As I say, he didn't really move outside the, the sole Greater Manchester area. The other thing I found out about him is that he, after he retired, he managed the Manchester Giants basketball team. <laughs> it seems... Uh, quite a big leap, doesn't it, from being a footballer all that time, and then suddenly you're in charge of a basketball. Team. Wow! So, wow! That's magnificent. Bert, Hats off to you, Bert. Yeah, Bert. Bert, what what a player! And I have no memory of him whatsoever, Richard. I'm so sorry, Bert. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm 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 sure he he'll be appreciative that we've even mentioned him. Um, the other player who scored actually both goals from. Barrow was a guy called Ron McGarry who played at Newcastle. For some reason, he was his nickname was Cassius, which I can't imagine was connected with Cassius Clay, but there we go. Apparently, he used to carry printed cards around with him, just saying, have goals, will travel. Which is quite <laughs> a robust thing, isn't it? Just saying, That's brilliant. Oh, he was his I'm own so, agent. Exactly. I'm so good. I just I'll just give you a card and then you come and get me. So I'm sort of imagining Erling Haaland having that tucked in his pocket and just so yeah. it's been So idea. this was this was this was a meeting of top strikers then. You had exactly. Lister and Swindells on one side season and have goals will travel McGarry on the other. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get what a game to go to. What a game exactly. to go to. Exactly. Um, and there were eight and a half thousand there. That is, you know, a reasonably big crowd, isn't it? It must have felt to, to you as a, you know, a, a young stripling, that must have felt like quite a big thing. Yes. I mean, Altie's, Altie's uh, um, cup runs used to used to get good crowds. I, I went to see them in 1975 play at Everton. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and Everton had, uh, was second in the, in, the, in the first division at that yeah. point. Uh, and they drew one all at Everton. And then the, the replay was at Old Trafford. And I went to that replay and Everton won that. Um, and the thing about Alty, right, um, it was interesting. Uh, I, I went to see uh, Maidstone play Coventry recently. And Maidstone played, uh, they got outclassed clearly, but yeah. they played really good football. They passed, they 
brought it out from the back. They played it along the deck. They, they, you know, they had four or five players in their squad who were coming down from the academies and, and, and so on. They were a proper, skillful football team, Maidstone. Ulti were just filthy. Right in 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 those days in those days of of um uh they used to they used to really kick lumps out of their league opponents and they had a guy called John King who was central midfielder he was absolutely filthy I remember they played um, Tottenham I think it was about seventy nine they played Tottenham in the third round of the cup and. John King was on the radio and I remember hearing him say, I'm going to kick lumps out of Ozzy Ardiles, uh, basically threatening me on the radio. And then they played. And indeed, within about 30 seconds, he went into this absolute uh, haymaker of a tackle with uh, Ardiles and just sent Ardiles flying. Um, Ardiles being a, you know, a proper player just got up yeah. and carried on. Uh, but John King um, said afterwards, uh, when someone said that was a terrible tackle on, on, uh, on, on our deal is he said, no, 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 no. It was two world-class players going for a 50, 50 ball. Um, well, you know, our deal is only won the world cup. with our Exactly. Teams, exactly. So and, that. and that, that Everton game was also were a, Absolute disgrace. John Connolly, who was the uh, uh, um, uh, Everton winger, uh, somebody that. broke his leg with a, uh, you know, basically an act of assault. Uh, and then uh, um, I can't remember the guy's name on the other wing. I think, um, anyway, he, uh, the other Everton winger, he retaliated and punched the ulti fullback who smacked it and got sent off so uh, Everton were down to 10 men and, and Alter got a draw uh, yeah. I mean you know their record was was incredible for a non-league side but also in the, in those days uh, to get out of non-league to get into the league you had to be voted in uh, yeah. and inevitably as a kind of uh, to self-preservation the league clubs would vote for the team that finished bottom of the of the league and and however good the non-league team coming through were that the, they wouldn't get through uh, the, the, the nadir of this was when the what became I think it was called the Alliance Premier League which became the National League became the conference became the National League uh, all two were founder members and one the Alliance Premier League in the first year had to get a vote to get into the uh, league. And I think, I can't remember who who they were up against, um, but they were... I believe they it were, was Rochdale. I Rochdale, that's right. right. They were up against Rochdale, who must have finished uh, bottom of, of, of the fourth division. And they lost the vote by 26 uh, uh, votes to 25. And they, they'd apparently um, got vote they you know they'd done it was a bit like trying to get the world cup you know uh probably yeah. a bit of white and swales money uh passing hands as they went round to get the vote and then yeah. and they've been promised uh, the votes uh of luton town and grimsby uh and when it came to the voting the the representative of grimsby went to the wrong room in the football league headquarters missed the vote and the luton town bloke arrived late and missed the vote and so um, Rochdale stayed in the league, and Alty didn't. Uh, and and you know that that moment when they were where when they were you know they had the heavy investment from White and Swales, and they were really good in the FA Cup. They never were able to translate that into a league status. And then White and Swales moved on. Uh, the 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 money left the club, and um, you know. They're in a really good place now, Alti. Very well run, sustainable, yeah. proper football club, doing well in the National League. But they've never actually managed to be in that position to get now that you can get playoffs and and and, and win and there's proper promotion and relegation. They've never actually managed to seize that opportunity. Yeah, I think um, I've, it's been raised a couple of times, the re-election system on this podcast. And... 
I think if you try to explain that to younger people, they really, really would struggle to understand how <laughs> you would go about doing this when I don't think you've got people chairman of clubs who are potentially, you know, going to be in that position the following year and they're going to say to their mates, it's okay, we're not going to send you out as long as you don't send us out next year. And it was just an old boys club with absolutely no, there was no, um, it wasn't down to quality, it wasn't down to results. It was just, oh, you know, I'll look after you if you look after me. Mad, mad. And thank God, it's it's ended and we've got a proper uh, promotion relegation from... And if you look at the clubs that now come through, you know, look at the, the what they bring, uh, you know, uh, Wrexham, Stockport, look at, look at, you know, those, those clubs, what the, what they're bringing uh, when they yeah. come up from the non-league, uh, what was, you know, it was kind of perpetuating poor standards in the, in the lower uh, divisions, um, and and basically, the only way you ever got evicted uh, was if you went bankrupt or bust. You know that was really it. Um, I want to go back to John King because I re- I read a little bit. Of course, he died a year ago, didn't he? So, he did. Yeah. <clears throat> he he also was then he became their manager, but as yes. a player, as a player, apparently he used to do this quite a lot. So the opposition changing room, he used to bang the door and say, we are going to get you, we are going to get you, come out, we want to get you, which is, I think, pretty intimidating. You know, apart from throwing around, you know, issues with our dealers on the radio, that is quite tough, isn't it? And as you say, Altrium sounded like this pretty hard, pretty uncompromising team. And maybe that's why they had such great success in the FA Cup. Because there basically was no no holes barred. We are going to kick the shit out of you and see how we get on. Yeah, King was a scouser actually, um, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think possibly there may have been an assumption. You know, genteel Altrincham, Victorian, lovely high street, uh, etc. Uh, now renowned for its magnificent um, food market, where uh, you know uh, uh, gourmets can go and enjoy delicious uh, suppers. Um, Maybe they weren't expecting it, but uh, you know, uh, King and King and uh, and as manager when he went on to be manager, it, it was so you're playing uh, a league club. Uh, what you do is, you know, you you bring the. Um, the touchline in, you full shorten yeah. the pitch, you drench it, uh, you know, and then you kick lumps out of them. That's how the non-league used to approach uh, cup ties in the past. Now they try and pass them off the park and generally yeah. fail. Yeah, although Mason, as you say, is an example of how you can play football and get there. Because um, when I looked at the record of all, as you say, they've got this amazing record. They, they have knocked out league club 17 times which is the most of any club that's never yes. been in the league I mean and that's that a, that, is incredible I, I, and it was a you know it was in many ways a, a reflection of the fact that I think I think the, the, the National League is probably stronger than it's ever been now but mm-hmm. even back then it was a reflection that it, a, a really well organised good fifth tier team was should have been higher up, you know. It was, it was, it was a, a damning indictment of of the system, which didn't allow promotion and relegation. Yeah, it is weird. And in fact, I I know Tommy Doherty is quoted as saying that all three of the Man United have done league football. Excuse me. Um, now you call them Alty. And I'm interested because actually their nickname officially is the Robins. So the Robins, yeah. Alty Robins. Um, how does that work? Um, yeah, the, the Robins because of the um, I, I presume you know the the red stripes um, yeah. uh, uh, w- 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 was that, but everybody who goes called them Alty. Um, okay. uh, that was that was you know. That was the shorthand for the town, and it was the shorthand for the football club. Um, and you know, uh, uh, I mean, you 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 mentioned that that uh, uh, the the 
way in which that Alti striker had played for all those clubs in Greater Manchester. I mean, Greater Manchester, even today, has an incredible uh, infrastructure of football clubs. You know, obviously... Uh, City and United are are at the heart of it. Uh, But then you've got around, you know, uh, clubs which have um, Oldham uh, uh, now in the National League, but uh, uh, once a Premier League club, uh, Rochdale, Stockport, you know. uh, uh, And then there's another tier of uh, yeah. of really strong non league clubs. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a remarkable um, kind of uh, a footballing infrastructure that that there is in Greater Manchester. Um, yeah. You know, people talk about Newcastle being a sort of hotbed of football and developing a lot of talent, but Manchester and Merseyside are really where it's at in terms of just this. The, the number of non-league clubs surrounding the two giants. You'd think, you'd think, wouldn't you, that the, the, the shadow cast by Old Trafford yeah. and the Etihad would squeeze everybody else out, but it doesn't. You know, look at Salford City. I know they've got a lot of money behind them, but sure. look at their progress. Uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't. And um, what a lot of the clubs, I mean, certainly Alti always used to do was they, they'd ensure that their fixtures alternated with United's right. um, so that you you would, their hope was uh, those United fans who didn't go to away games would come and watch Alti on the alternate times um i don't know how successful that was financially um but that was definitely what they did so they would they would learn ways to accommodate the fact that they had this giant on their doorstep it's a bit like tranmere playing on friday nights isn't it because they wanted to avoid clashing with liverpool and everton so that was quite a good idea to you know try and attract a few more people um as you say, Northwest clubs, particularly in that year you went, uh, 1968, they were dominant because Man City actually won the <laughs> first division that year by two points from United, funny enough. And then I think we need to move on to United now. That, before we do, actually, there are a couple of things that strike me about Ultra. As you say, it seems to be a very well-run club. It seems to, I think it's now fully professional, which is unusual for that level, if not unique. But you, you've got two things that really struck me. And I don't know when you went to that first game, whether they had a mascot or whether you remember that it might have been a Robin, who knows. But then famously, the mascot became Frank Sidebottom. And, you know, if, if you're going to have a mascot, you're going to have someone with that sort of comic stroke musical genius that I, I mean, you can't think of many better mascots than Frank Sidebottom. Uh, and also, I don't know, you could maybe you could verify this. Apparently Ricky Ponting, the Australian cricketer, became a shareholder in 2008. And then I think also Mark Chapman, Radio 5 Lives, Mark Chapman is a keen fan. Does he... Do you still go to Altrincham? Do you bump into these things? I mean, obviously, yeah, Mark, like Mark is no longer with us. I cannot, uh, yeah, of course, uh, um, I, 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 I cannot claim that he's a contemporary of mine, but Mark went to the same school as me, so comes from the same sort of background. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it's an extremely well run club for a time they were affiliated with united and the united uh, uh under 21s used to play their matches there uh right. not anymore um uh, i i i i think that association's ended but they you know they found ways of doing it but n- now they've got They've got money behind them. They have a kind of uh, an association with Altering and Market. So there's food, really nice street food available when you go. There's a good experience. Um, and as you say, they're, they're fully professional. So, you know, they get players on, young players on loan from the big clubs around about, which, which helps them get through. I mean, I mean it's, it, 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 it's a club that wants to get league football there. Um, and, but that ambition, Richard, has been there for my entire life. You know, back in in 1968, they wanted league football. 
Uh, White yeah, and Swales yeah. wanted league football there. Um, and the, the assumption was they they could survive and they could make it. You know, I mean, for a while, their southern equivalent, although they never got the same uh, FA Cup runs as a, as a, as a non-league club, were, were Wimbledon. And you see what, what happened to Wimbledon. Wimbledon yeah. got to the, to, to the top league. And Alty yeah. always reckoned themselves to be the, the northern equivalent of Wimbledon. Yeah, sure. And um, I was amused to see when, as you say, they had an incredible FA Cup record. They also were pretty good in the FA Trophy. Um, and they went there, I think, three times in the space of about six years. And amazingly, I heard that the Lionel Richie song, Once, Twice, Three Times a Lady, was actually then converted by Ultraman fans once, twice, three times. <laughs> three times a trophy. Oh, well, I went, to, I went to Wembley when I was at university to see them, uh, and they lost, and I'm trying to think who they played. Enfield, I think. Was yes, that right? I think you're right. Yeah, uh, yeah I think that's correct. So I went. I went from uh, university to to watch them there w- w- with a group of mates. We all met up and and, and paid on the gate at Wembley to watch oh, a cup go. final. <laughs> yeah, that 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 also would probably appear a little bit weird to our young uh, audience. <laughs> but, you know, these things we, you'll be astonished to hear. I don't think there were a hundred thousand there. Mm. But there was a good twenty thousand. There was there was a good there was a good crowd. I think uh, uh, there were a lot of Ulti fans, and Enfield brought brought fans. I mean, the thing is, if you you know if you come from that part of the world when you've got this great uh, worldwide sporting institution down the road, inevitably you gravitate to that. But you you retain a kind of affiliation and affection for the local club um, and, and you know, I, I, I would think most United fans in, in that part of the world would have Ulti as their second team. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, that's a, an acceptable second team as well, rather than switching around because you think, oh, those those people are going to win the Premier League this year, and maybe that <laughs> happens to some people. I'm I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> um, but that Ricky Ponting thing, do, do, is that has that got any um, credence, or is that just someone sort of making stuff up? Uh, well, uh, I, it's the first I'd heard uh, when you mentioned right. that. Uh, so I, it may have been a publicity stunt. Um, I don't recall uh, reading of him going to watch matches at Moss Lane. No. Um, you know, I think I think the romantic lure of Moss Lane is not as strong as the one to Old Trafford, to be honest. Possibly not, but maybe he was playing cricket at Old Trafford. Someone mentioned, he could have oh, been. You know, he could have been. Uh, yeah. Come along, come along and watch. Uh, um, you know, uh, nothing cheeses uh, residents of Liverpool off more, by the way, than the fact that uh, uh, Lancashire Cricket Club play in Manchester. It's fantastic. In fact, my scouser mate um, tells me uh, that the one season that they played a lot at Egbert in Liverpool, uh, they won. They won the league, they won the county championship because there was less rain in Liverpool than there is in Manchester, so they had fewer games rained off that season. Right. Uh, Old Trafford, so he's a meteorologist, Old Trafford, is he? Yeah. He's, Old Trafford he's, was yeah. being Old Trafford was being reconstructed, so they played most of their um, uh, home county. Uh, championship matches at uh, Egbert and uh, did much better than they would have done if they'd been at Old Trafford. But again, it's great that you know Lancashire play just down the road from uh, um, United. It's uh, it's you know that is proper hotbed, isn't it? It is pretty impressive. Sort of a bit like um, Nottingham with Trent Bridge, and then you've got Forest and County, literally. Oh yeah, that is a fact. That. Uh, the, those drone pictures of uh, the Trent with yeah. the County on one side, Forest and, uh, 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 and and the cricket ground next to each other is is magnificent. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned your dad wasn't much of a football fan; he's more a cricket rugby fan. Did he take you to, uh, let's say, a Lancashire game or even a Test match or rugby before he took you to Altrincham? Is there anything to compare with in terms of 
the match going experience at that age? Well, for my 15th birthday, my dad bought me a junior season ticket to um, Old Trafford. Uh, right. So I went to see loads of uh, Lancashire games with him. Uh, and, um, you know, my Scouse meteorology friend was probably right. I think half of them were rained off. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you, you, go, you go with the blows. Um, <laughs> I just want to go back to that that day when you went to your first game at Moss Lane, because just up the road was uh, Man United were actually playing at Old Trafford uh, and they beat West Ham 3-1. Aston, Best and Charlton, ABC. I quite like that. Brooking School for West Ham. There were 59,500 people there and you're, you know, at Moss Lane. So there's a bit of a gap. But what I want to get into now is the next game you went to in terms of you moved up the road a little bit and you actually did go to Old Trafford and it was November 1974. So this is a bit of a gap there, isn't there? There's a six-year gap. Had you Did you go to any other games or was this just the second game you went to or it was the first game I think you went to at Old Trafford? So explain the gap to me. Yeah, no, I used to go to a lot of Ulti games with dad. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I went to school, uh, when I went to uh, school in Manchester, uh, you know, my mates um, took me. But you have to remember, this was uh, a time of um, uh, pretty bad hooliganism and, and, and United had a reputation for being pretty bad. My parents were not encouraging, shall we say for me to go. Uh, but my mates from school uh, were going and uh, eventually um, I went along with them. Uh, that would be the gap. But I was going to a lot of Ulti games in between. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, um, it was a completely different thing. It, it, I watched on the TV. I watched United constantly on the TV, but but going along was a completely different thing. And we we stood on what was called uh, the Stretford Paddock, which was slightly to the side of the Stretford end, and mm. just watching the tumbling down the Stretford end and the noise and everything was so seductive. Um, and I, I, you know, I I bought into it completely, and I suppose. That, uh, this would be a reflection of the fact I was now a teenager. My complete hero, having been uh, George Best uh, a, 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 as a as a younger man, my my complete hero uh, when I was um, when I eventually got to Old Trafford was Willie Morgan, um, and I had my hair cut like Willie Morgan's, which was a remarkable kind of three tier like a wedding cake, three-tier <laughs> Buffon uh, thing, nice. uh, yeah. which, you know, and I took a picture of uh, Willie Morgan along to the barbers to have my hair cut like his. Um, and it took a lot of, it, it took a lot of care. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, I've, I've met w Willie Morgan subsequently. I've never told him about this, but um, right. uh, I, I'm not sure how he, you know, how much time he had to spend in the, uh, in the changing room after a game, um, you know, getting, getting the, the dryer in to kind of curl the, the long ends at the bottom of the base of the, of the, of the structure. Uh, together, but I spent hours doing it. So I went to that game, Sunderland. It was when United were in the second division. Yeah, paid on the gate. You had to get there early because uh, right. you know it's still filled up. Uh, got to Old Trafford and uh, was uh, completely and utterly smitten, and that was it. I just started going all the time, and I think because I was now, you know. 15 or whatever it was yeah. uh my, my mom and dad were you know well he can look after himself now um uh and 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 so off i went and just went to games pretty much constantly thereafter there was one season uh, may have been the i think it may have been the first season they were back in the in the first division 
And uh, I think I must have been in the sixth form by then. And I went to every home game and a load of away games. Um, you know, I remember going with my mate to um, uh, his, his brother had uh, took the family car and we went to a match at Stoke. So that was my first away game for United. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that I, it was completely transformative. And by then, uh, all two were becoming, you know, a bit of a less of an obsession. Though, as I said, I did go to the Everton uh, Cup tie in the 75, would it have been January 75? Yeah. And the replay was at Old Trafford. So I went went to that as well. 